first. Tea breaks about 10.30. I don't have any announcements until the end of the morning. Okay, okay, got it. Good morning. Did, Hannah, did you have any announcements? Okay, good morning, everybody. Okay. Oh, maybe we're not all here. I spoke too soon. Oh, now there, those are good looking serious boots. No, 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 the purple. <laughs> those are cute too, but I actually, I had my eye on the purple. Um, I, I, I'd like to, uh, to focus your attention on yourselves. I know that would be difficult, but attention on yourselves. And on to, to um, have you remind yourselves of the issue that you are working on. At all times, track back to that. Track back to that. So as we go into the graces and the shadows, and as we work our way through the labyrinth of the interior of yourself, and the, 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 shall we say, the psychic field within which you reside and are working and live at all times, that you're actually working through the complexity of how extraordinarily powerful you are, and at the same time, how complex one, one situation or one dynamic is in your life. You know, what, what, you're, what you're working with is this phenomenon of how extraordinarily complex one dynamic is, and yet at the same time, how easily influenced it is. See, both are true. Both are true at the same time. That, and this is like, the, like actually seeing the butterfly effect and, and, and how dynamically real that butterfly effect is that in, in shifting one, one perception, one relationship, one angle that you have, one inner truth, in shifting one dynamic of pride, for example, in holding one person, <clears throat> let's go into that shadow of, of pride and look at, look at the issue you have. And if I'm, I, I, I would might even w uh, work with one of you just to make it real, but you have some issue or some illness that you're working with within yourself. And I will tell you, pride is a part of every illness. How can I break down? How can my body break down? What does this say about me? How can I possibly break down? It is a part of you. Pride will hit you anytime your body encounters anything, whether it's an illness or any kind of anything. What does it mean? It will hit that part of you. What will people think of me if this is what I have? or if this is what I'm going through. Absolutely. Or if this is a crisis that comes to me, what if I go through the crisis of job loss? What if I go through the crisis of financial loss? What if I go through this? What if that happens to me? There are a lot of people in my country now that are losing their homes. Personal friends of mine are losing their homes because of this subprime mortgage horrible crisis. 
that are going to find themselves in, in having to, to move in with their kids. Crises that they never thought they would face. This affects that part, literally that rooted part of yourself, where as a result, that whole grace of reverence gets shut off because you no longer have a sense of, for what's, what's the purpose of my life? I mean, what's it been about? You cut off that whole stream, that there's any dignity to, to your life or any purpose. And what, it, what happens is you start to feed off of shame. I'm ashamed of this. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of where my choices have led me. And the energy, the toxicity of shame starts to poison, and I will tell you this, your immune system. And it starts specifically to poison your joints. And it starts to go right directly into your skeletal area. And it inflames joints and skeleton, your skeletal system. And then it hits your immune system. So if you want to see how this triggers, it is all part of one huge cycle. You cannot, it is impossible to have one thing and not affect the whole. And this is how it goes in specifically through the first. And then it tumbles and tumbles and tumbles and tumbles. Tumbles. And then so long as you have this sense of shame, if you think you can handle and tackle your immune system, I don't care how drug, you go to any doctor and you get drugged and you do this, you, you may as well go eat cat food because it will not help you. You can get chopped and pasted and whatever you want. But the fact is, so long as you hold yourself in this sense of being ashamed of your body, of your life, of, of what's happened to you, and how you conduct yourself, you cannot repair yourself. You need that grace that says, wait a minute here, wait, well, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. I am coming from the wrong spot. A little dignity is needed here. I have to re-engage with this sense that life itself is enough. I need to re-engage with a sense of pride, with a sense of dignity, with a sense of reverence with the sense that I have got to get out of this sense that unless I have something, unless my body doesn't break down, unless I'm greater than the ordinary, I'm worthless. Which brings me to a point that I really elaborated on in this book, which is also first chakra. Now I'm into first chakra as opposed to the graces for a minute, but one of the, of the things that is absolutely true about human beings is that we are, of the many things that drive us, whether or not we admit it, is that we are driven by an absolute contempt of the ordinary. We will, yes, yes, it is true. We, we, one of our inner things is God make me anything but not, don't make me ordinary. And it's absolutely true. The idea that we could possibly be among the ordinaries is just too appalling for words. Too appalling. I'm, I'm, I'm many things, but the one thing I am not, I will tell you right now, is ordinary. <laughs> and I listen to parents, the boring parents. Parents bore the hell out of me. And they, and they say things like, my child is extraordinary. <laughs> not ordinary. I don't have an ordinary for a child. I have an extraordinary. They always let you know their child is extraordinary. And why would that be? Because it's mine. Do you think I would give birth to an ordinary? <laughs> My child is extraordinary. You may think so, but what I see there looks pretty ordinary to me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's extraordinary, I'm telling you right now. Well, we'll see. But so far, I'm not seeing anything extraordinary in that basket. You know, but I see a diaper and a bottle, but there's nothing extraordinary from where I'm sitting. 
But I mean, you can be as enamored as you want, but what you're actually saying is, God, please, not, don't, make, don't give me anything ordinary. But I'll tell you what, we need air in here. That this may be a cute little place, but what they really screwed up on was circulation. So can you open some doors here for air? Because I'm beginning to see, the, you know, and we can't have that. So just keep the doors open, and that would, that's going to work just fine. Does that work for everybody? Okay. So this thing about being ordinary, the, and this is very first chakra. This is very first. This is very much in your first. How many of you absolutely can't bear the thought that you might be ordinary? There you go. There you go. Okay. Now, I'm going to follow this through because this is attached to your pride. This is attached exactly to this shadow. How many of you won't admit you can't bear the thought of it? Okay, and the rest of you are totally content with being ordinary. Mm-hmm. Liar, liar, your pants are on fire. So, <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Um, the need to not be ordinary is such a deep thread that goes all the way archetypally to the belief that if you're extraordinary, the ordinary can't happen to you. And in fact, the ordinary won't happen to you. That you're prevented from ordinary things. See, if you're extraordinary, ordinariness can't happen to you. And it's the ordinariness of the first chakra, specifically. This is very, very fascinating to me. Very fascinating. And the ordinarinesses of the first chakra include the chaos of life. <laughs> chaos won't strike. It won't strike me. It'll strike you because you're ordinary. But it won't strike me. I am prevented from awful obstacles happening, from getting fired. That's an ordinary thing. Because I'm not ordinary. They fire ordinaries. But they know I'm extraordinary. I get the desk in the corner. I get the office with all the windows. Because I'm extraordinary. This is what people believe. Because this is the privilege of the extraordinary. But if you can't find a way to get to the extra category, you're in big trouble. So you have to do something to put you in that category because this is all part of the ritual of making sure your body doesn't break down like an ordinary, of making sure your life doesn't break down, of making sure the ordinary things in life that happen, divorce, bad kids, Things falling out of or order in the ordinary way. Children dying before their parents. That's something that happens to the ordinaries, but not the extraordinaries. Financial problems in the huge ordinary way don't happen to the extraordinaries. So you've got to be extraordinary. Now this is all a superstition but it is the psyche of the archetype of the extraordinary. And people will do anything to reach the extraordinary. They give themselves new names that are extraordinary. What's your name? Sunshine Meditation Karma. <laughs> Where the hell did you come up with that? Well, but it, you see, it, it includes all the special extraordinary things. Okay, then. My name's Moonlight, whatever. Okay, but it includes all the extraordinaries. Who could argue with a name like that? Okay. But think about what you do. People tattoo themselves, not just here but everywhere, to be extraordinary. They give their children the most outrageous look to make sure their child's extraordinary over the ordinary. My child does all of these things 
so it can outrun the ordinary. And it will outrun. You get there and run. Do you hear me? You work out. You do this. You do that. Because I've got to make you extraordinary so you can survive in the ordinaries. And all of this comes from this polarity of the first chakra force between pride and reverence. If I don't make you extraordinary, you won't touch reverence. Believe it or not, this is where it comes from. If I don't make you extraordinary, you'll never feel reverent. You'll never feel. And the first level of reverence that the ego can grasp is that level of uh, regard or respect. But if they don't get there, it turns into arrogance. And the only way you feel good about yourself is to make someone feel bad about themselves. And that's where the worst of the pride comes in. You really don't feel good about yourself, but the only way you can feel good about yourself is to make someone else feel horrible about themselves. And that's where it begins. This is where war begins. So if you don't think you've got what it takes to make war, here it is. Here's your point of contact. And those experiences that they say, those tests people have, those, uh, not tests, um, experiments that people have where they say they take people and they can turn them into a Nazi in 20 seconds, absolutely, here's your point. Right there, how simple is that? It doesn't matter what your background is, what your religion, any of that. All of that is nonsense. All you gotta do is go right there. Here's your point. You have no pride in yourself. Of the, you have no sense of reverence for anyone else. You can be made a Nazi in, oh, I don't know, 30 seconds. That's it, that's all it takes. A good old uniform, a couple of stripes on your, a couple of lightning rods up here. And someone that you absolutely, to, the permission to pass on pain to someone and feel better than them. Legal arrogance. That's all it is. Legal arrogance. And you're on your way. You are on your way. That's all it takes. So now this is where you look to yourself and you think, how much of what it is you are dealing with in yourself and how much of your own hemorrhaging of your soul, how much comes out of you over this matter versus your capacity to see yourself, how much have you suffered on in terms of being ashamed of yourself, fearing that, fearing being humiliated, and then as a result, attack others and lose a sense of your own reverence of your life. Think about the battles you've waged right here in your first chakra. This is why when people say, oh, you know, to get better, I just have to mm, visualize. You're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. Look at, the, look at just the, the war you wage in your first chakra, and this is where your immune system is. I'm going to pause here and ask you if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah. Um. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I forgot. Sorry. Hannah, the magic um, microphone. <clears throat> it might just be semantics, but would mm. different be another word for extraordinary? Because... No. Okay. Because extraordinary... Pardon, sorry, maybe I should clarify. Yeah, because... would you define different before I comment? How you mean different? Because extraordinary... To... I'm almost, from what you were describing, I'm almost back to front on some of the, some things because... Back to front? Because, like, things happen to the extraordinary, whereas the ordinary is almost a way to avoid... Am I on my own? No? Maybe? Um, the, the ordinary is a way to avoid extraordinary things. Yeah. Huh? What, Claire? mm, -mm. Yeah. Wait a minute, Claire. Claire, Claire hold. Am I, am I right? Tall, tall poppy syndrome. I don't it's, know. What it's an is. Australian characteristic. It means put your head above the parapet and along will come the mower and take you off. 
It's a characteristic. It's a cultural oh, I characteristic. Don't be noticed. Kind enforcing of thing. the ordinary as positive, a positive okay, role model for survival. I get survival. that. I get that. Um, don't don't show yourself too much. But you know what? I still will challenge that because you even in the what you call a tall poppy syndrome, which is very that's clever. But even in that, what will happen is the need to be extraordinary will become subvertive. And it will show up in, in negative habits that are extraordinary. It what? will show up in, in negative syndromes that are extraordinary within a tribe. A person will become the tribal eccentric. Is it possible extra different is the tribal expressive word in Australia for extraordinary is where I was going. Well, no, here's the word, here's the significance of extra. Extra means that you have found a way to be above what you discern as the ordinary. It is, it is a, 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 a um, definitive choice to step away or outside what you perceive as your ordinary world. And you have found one pattern that disassociates you from your ordinary world. And different is not what I'm talking about. It's a pattern of protection that says the ordinary suffering and ordinary crises cannot happen to me because I wear pink ribbons all the time. I'm in the realm of the eccentric now. I'm in the realm of someone who has a superstitious, funky habit. I'm in the realm of someone who always wears purple hats, who does something eccentric or extraordinary, but they do it for superstitious rituals so that they're protected so that in their mind, they're protected from the ordinary crises of specifically the first chakra happening to them, which are tribal crises, crises of the breakdown of tribal family, crises of the breakdown of uh, security systems, banking crises, financial security systems going bad on you. Family systems, your family breaking down, you getting abandoned by family, your family falling apart, your pension falling apart, you suddenly finding out when you wake up your stocks are gone, things you finding yourself homeless. First chakra crises, no, these will not happen to you. First chakra diseases, epidemics, cancers, these things will not happen to you. They happen to the ordinaries. Ergo, you will never say, I don't know how this could have happened to me. It took me by surprise. I never thought this would happen to me. Why? Because I'm extraordinary. Who did you think it would happen to? Well, an ordinary, of course. Of course, but not me, because I'm extraordinary. See, it's that kind of pattern. Well, what's pride? What is pride? That's exactly what it is. It's a form of arrogance. That's what pride is. Whereas what reverence, that grace of reverence, is, is a grace that says, I am, that I have life. That I am alive. This is that grace that you witness in people who are dying. Unfortunately, that's when we see it most clearly. Are people who have, uh, are dying, or people who've had a near-death experience, or people who have come very close to losing their lives in an accident, and, or are in a life-threatening situation, and then they come back and in that little window of life threat. They have this sense to where pride is no longer their, their wall between themselves and others. And they're able to say, I, you know what, I, 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 these are my values. I, 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 if I live through this, if I get through this, I'm never going to, I realize how important this person is to me. I realize this, I realize that, and I'm never going to be this way, this way, this way again. 
They now see the world through the sacredness of being alive, period. Period. Not through what they have, not through shame. Simply let me live. And that's the grace of reverence. I simply have a reverence for being alive, just life, just life. Life never looks so beautiful to me as finding out I don't have cancer. Oh my God, life looks so precious. And, and all of a sudden that sense of arrogance that in order for me to feel good about my life, I have to have and you have to yield and my pride has to be acquiesced in every single situation. I must get my way. I must be extraordinary in every single encounter. The extraordinary has to win over the ordinary. I must render you and make you ordinary in order for me to feel good about me. My pride must take charge. It's not enough for me just to be alive and just recognize your life as equally reverent to mine. I got to beat you to a pulp. This is that grace. But you can't access this grace if your pride is on lead. You just can't do it. Now think about how much pain you have in your life or how much pain you cause others because of pride. How many of you are not talking to someone because of pride? Up, 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 up. Okay. How many of you have ever been in that situation where you just simply refuse. I refuse to talk to them. And it's, you don't even remember why. It's just that somehow I think pride's involved, but at any rate, I'm not talking to them. And you get that. Okay, now here's a question. At what point, just think about your pride, whatever that is. Who, who, where, where did the rules come from with your pride that you decided this offends me, but this doesn't? Who gave your pride the rules? Like, I'm offended, but at this point, I've decided I become offended. I mean, think about that. Now, all of a sudden, now I'm going to take offense. You've just raised your voice to the tone that I've decided, now that tone offends me. This tone doesn't, but that tone does. Think about this. It's all random. It's all subjective. But all of a sudden, you've decided, now that tone offends me. This one doesn't, but that one does. You know, it's, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. Or what is it about you, in you, where you decide you're someone I'm going to have a power play with? You don't go that route with everybody. There's lots of people in your life you don't engage with in terms of a power play. That they don't get your pride where you think, I have got to win with this person. I got to get the last word in. But now think of someone with whom you just got to win and your pride's at stake. What is it about that person that makes them different from other people where you've got to win? Talk to me. What is it? You're married to them. Okay. 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 And you just got to bet. It's a battlefield there. Okay. What else? Yeah. And what about your boss? Wait a minute, Hannah. <laughs> We've got the person, but what is it about that? What is it about it where you say, because a lot of people can be your boss and you don't lock in. What is it about that dynamic for you? Uh, th the feeling of him that I'm, he's trying to control me. And, and feeling quite often belittled. Okay, so it's got your pride going. Mm. Humiliation, the lack of power, and the lack of acknowledgement that you have any value. Yeah. So there's no reverence. He has no reverence for you. Yeah. He yeah. has no reverence. The absence of reverence. Yeah. It's the absence of the grace of reverence. Mm. 
But then, then I find in myself, I'm, I, you know, I am battling currently with him and kind of... So what you're saying is really ringing chords with me, like how much actually I'm trying now to put him down and... That's right. You'll return the favor. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right, 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 right. So I feel like I'm fighting for who I am. You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. And again, there is a part of me thinking, for goodness sake, I don't actually need this man to... To keep my sense of me and my sting. Now, but as bizarre as this is going to sound to you, as bizarre, this disease, and it is, now this is where disease, you, you've got to understand. I'm going to show you something. Um, I'll just draw this for a second. I know it's a, what happened to my real pen? There. Um, I know this is a minuscule drawing. And it's just so very basic, but ouch. It, but there must be an eraser too. Caroline. Where is this an eraser? This way. All right. Okay. Yes. And look. And it works. Okay. 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 This il the illustration works because it just works, but it's like no big deal. But it works. If you really could picture yourselves like this, with energy, and remember I told you at some level you recognize that energy is grace, and you don't call it energy, but here you go. All right. What you, this, here you are. Um, here's the point of everything. Every response you have, every choice you make, every everything distributes you into some target area, into some target point. And if this was a classroom before we incarnated, and I'm your last coach, okay, I'm your last coach before you descend, and I'm telling you that your journey on the physical plane is all about mastering the relationship and how well you learn to distribute the relationship between the power of your soul and its relationship to matter. Incarnate, incarnating energy into matter, energy into matter, energy into matter. That's all you're going to do on Earth. That's it. That's all you do. You're a little machine. That's all you do. The object of the, the journey of illumination is that the divine is going to instruct you on the tasks you are meant to do. The object, the test, is whether you listen with your ear to the outside or the inside. Now that tuning fork is the difference between pain and suffering. Therein lies the human experience. Whether you attune more to your inner ear or your outer ear. And that will determine the quality of choices you make about how you distribute this power every single day. It's actually as simple as that. It's, the, it's as simple as that. The rest is your theater of drama that you create along the way. The rest is your theater of drama. But in a nutshell, this is it. The simplicity. Whether you want to see this theater as sacred or whether you want to see this theater as simply life and organic, or you want to see however you want to see it, you see it. But in a nutshell, this is all there's to life. Some of us like big, huge religious mythologies and costume parties, and some will fight to the death over their costume parties. But at the end of the day, the journey of being on this planet is a journey of the power we have to make choices and put, th direct our energy into matter, and that's it. 
At some point, what happens is we begin to realize that energy is sacred and it is soul. And when that transition comes and we recognize that sacred, you must recognize that the person opposite you is equally sacred. And that's the grace of reverence. And in that instant, you change your relationship with the whole of life. All of life becomes reverent. That's not, that is not a simple, I think I like this idea of rev, me being reverent. A grace is never about you. The ego can't tolerate that. It almost chokes on that truth. Because it'll always say, how can I use this to get more out of life, to serve me? A grace is never about you. A grace is a force that comes through you that you take everyone with. And it makes everyone better, including you. It is an awakening that says, oh my God, not only am I reverent, but I am standing on reverent ground. This is sacred ground. No matter where I put my feet. So when someone says, that's sacred ground, and I think, what isn't sacred ground? Well, excuse me, but what isn't sacred ground, you crazy environmentalist? <laughs> you mad druid? Everything is sacred ground. Snap out of it. How what? Wait a minute. There are times when I get it. I really get it. And the other person is I believe is you do. I can hear that in your voice. And then I lose it. And don't we all? And you know, there were times during my Teresa experience, my, when I was so intimately involved with Teresa of Avila, that was what I would call the holiest time of my life. Holy. It was holy. My life was like a living sanctuary when I was writing Entering the Castle. It was like a sanctuary. There were times when I would be writing Entering the Castle when I would... Uh, truly, it was the only time in my life where 11 hours passed and I didn't know it. When I would be charting, trying to feel, sense my way through the fifth mansion, and I would be in another place. And I would come down, and I would feel like I had been go. oh, the feeling. Then I'd walk out the door, and I'd think, who's the jackass that did this? <laughs> to my, <laughs> that's all it took. Someone left trash on my lawn. That's all it took. That's all, trash on my lawn. Who's the jackass that did this? And, but what, what, what I found out was that the distance between that elevation and this became increasingly difficult to bear, falling from that altitude. It was like, going, oh my God, oh my God. It hurt, it hurt to fall into five senses so fast. It was like falling onto five sensory concrete. I can't, it was like falling like, oh man, ouch, 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 and ouch. I, I got it yesterday, the minute that I, went back into that place, yeah, that I lost it. And I, I got it, but it was too late because I hurt someone. That's it, you got it, you hurt, you got it, you get it, you got it. This is when a mystic would say, oh God, this hurts. Okay, what an ordinary thinks, what the outsider to this precious information, to this precious truth teaching, mystical, mystical truth believes is that, and they use this 
so that they can stay away from sacred illumination is that God tortures people who come close to the power of their soul. So, and, and of course, the Catholics have, have marketed this successfully so they can get money for churches. But the truth is that it's awakening to this power that the, that the human soul has that is the divine dynamic of, oh my God. So this is the de elegance of creation. And you breathe in every minute and so do I. Oh my God, you're so close. You actually really do hear everything. Oh my God, you actually really do hear it. I can, you are actually, you really are in everything. I, I don't know that I can live that close to you. Oh, Jesus, there's no chance. There's no choice. Oh, Buddha, no wonder there's light. And light is everywhere. So that means it's in every person. Oh, God, what an unpleasant thought. <laughs> that is not pleasant. I don't like that thought. I'm not prepared to see light in Republicans. I am not prepared. No, really, I'm not prepared. I can't go there right now. I can't, I have to go there. I have to go there. I have to go there. Okay, I have to go there. This is like walking on glass for me. This is like glass. Okay, this is like glass. This is really nauseating. This may take trips to the bathroom. But I have to do it. I have to do this. I have to, okay, God, I have to do Whoa. Okay, shut the door. This actually hurts. It hurts my esophagus. It hurts my stomach. It hurts my... It hurts. It makes, brings tears to my eyes. It's so painful. But I cannot be true to this and not say, okay, I have to hold them in reverence. Oh, my pride. No. This is so painful for me. I'll put it out there. That I, it brings tears to my eyes. It hurts. But I cannot not do this. My pride says, those bastards, what they have done to my country, what they're doing to the Middle East, what they're doing, what they're doing, what they're doing. Okay, so now I have to hold back and say, how do I know what's going on? How do I know what's going on? I do not know from the larger scope of human evolution what's really being played out. How do I know? How do I know? I don't know. Claire, I don't know what the huge, huge, huge scope of human evolution is. To take any one time zone, to take any, no matter how much history I pour in my head, still we do not know the mind of evolution. Do, and f anyone is foolish to decide, I know exactly what's going on. I still cannot like their choices. But at the end of the day, history and divinity has the last laugh. Even they cannot outrun what I must have faith in, which is the higher power governing life. And every time, and I have to pull myself back and go back toward the grace of reverence, which has where I need to put my force and trust that that grace and holding them in reverence is where I need to go because the other makes me toxic. And this is what John of the Cross realized. He realized if I go near my pride, I will poison you and poison me. And while I may not see the impact of using the grace of reverence immediately, I must trust that that is the power in me I call on. And your boss may never say, boy, I don't know what's in the atmosphere today. How are you? It's not about that. See, the ego wants to see the immediate cause and effect. And you don't do, you do not operate from grace for anything but, but knowing that it is the higher choice. And you take your hands off the... And this is why working with your ego 
become such a difficult thing to do. But holding on to that, healing at the high altitudes requires you take on your ego. Not taking on someone else's. This is why people don't heal. They think healing is about figuring out who hurt your ego and holding them accountable. It is not. It's about you taking on your own ego. It's your ego that's hurting you, not theirs. There's only you in your body. You're the one talking to you. They're gone. They are not in your head. You have to take you on. You can be your worst enemy. They're gone. What, Claire, I'm going to let you interrupt one more time, and then I have to keep going. So what is it? I love your daughter to pieces, but I have to put a limit on her. Go. What? Thanks, Dad. Um, I have a question about... Um, the shadows and their use as the shadows, as I understand it, can be me. I know this is intellectual. That's not where I'm going. The shadows can be used or misused by the ego. And yet you have another process described, which is about the scaffolding of the graces into the sixth or seventh mansion where the dissolution that takes place, I think, is the dissolution of the, the dissolution of the ego. So what if pride as a shadow is about the interaction of the shadow and the ego, but pride as Claire, a developmental where where scaffolding. Where are you going? I'm going to what the evolutionary process by which we lose the immune system because we don't need it. Because the process okay. that holds people inside one person is a process of scaffolding. And all the shadows are only shadows because they're available for scaffolding Clara, of the graces. stop, stop, stop. Okay. Take that microphone away from her, Hannah. You're off mic duty. That's it for this morning. No more. I don't know. <laughs> what, if is, what if is a possibility? It could be. I don't know. I don't know. What if is possible? Yeah, yes, you may. Wait. You mentioned the inside and the outside and the difference between listening to the inside and the outside. Where's the position where you're not sure whether you're allowing the outside to flow or you're trying to, um, what's the word, guide the outside? Because you sound like you guide the outside, but I, th I wonder whether s some people allow it to flow and think it'll happen without doing anything. Does that make any sense? No, but put, <laughs> you know what I want you to do is put an example to your question. Okay. Uh, my background is sales, marketing, and all of that sort of thing. You set goals, you set objectives, and you achieve them. And that has a lot of ego involved with it. When you transfer over, and you look at the other path, it's very hard to say. Sometimes I think, well, go with the flow because God, grace, whatever mm -hmm. energy, whatever you want to call it, will take me to there, mm -hmm. and I don't have to set that goal. Mm -hmm. But somehow there's something that I feel that's I'm missing. A, okay, <laughs> yes, okay. That's a, that's a wonderful question that represents one of the, uh, an illusion that people are under and a fear, which is that it's either or. Either you go completely into mystical madness, mm -hmm. which is a, oh, what the hell, here, go God, go. <laughs> or you are an absolute control freak, which is, it's all mine to do and you butt out. Unless I'm in a crisis, and then I'll hit the, the faith mayday mayday button. Going down, going down. Okay. Which is the way human beings live. Okay. SOS, SOS. Or actually, SMS, save my soul. Or SMA. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 
the, the prayer of the first chakra, save my ass, right? <laughs> okay. But it's not. What, what mystical consciousness is, which is what really this is about, it's bringing to bear its grace within your perception. It's bringing to bear the reality that of, of reverence within the choices and the way in which you conduct yourself in life and, and in business as well. Holding a field in your mind that what you're doing is sacred, no matter what you're doing, does not change the fact that you're in advertising or you're in marketing. But if you were to say, well, this, this is holy and not diminish it, that all things have a sacred calling to them. That in order for me to do something of value to, uh, and of service, I don't have to leave this. That I bring the sacred to it once I, in fact, start seeing myself, myself, as being in a field of reverence. One of the great illusions of the new age, and there are so many, the whole thing should be trashed is that, or rebooted, is that we have to go somewhere else into some organic nature field and eat vegetables in order to be spiritual. That it could never happen in a city. That a spiritual awakening can never happen in a business occupation. That in fact, the grace of reverence could never ignite in the middle of a corporate meeting. The hell it can't. That's exactly where it should ignite, in the middle of the Pentagon. In the middle of a corporate, in the middle of parliament. is exactly when someone should go and wake up and say, oh my God, this is a field of grace. There is no difference. I, I, I'm having a mystical experience. The only difference is I've never seen it before. And it's going to be hard as hell to hold that altitude. Very, very, very difficult to hold that altitude. Very difficult. It's one of those things where you go, whoa, boom, down again. But in that instant, you see what, and here's exactly the words I mean, the highest potential of that moment. And that is the grace of fortitude, which is the fourth grace. The grace of fortitude is to hold the highest potential of any given situation at any given time. God, give me that grace. I'm losing it. I am losing it. I am slipping, and I am moving into a bad place. But what is the highest potential of any given situation, of any given moment, of any given anything right now? Give me that grace, because I am losing it, and I'm slipping into a bad place. But you look and think, I, I do have the choice to see what I am doing as very sacred. And if I did, how then would I see and what quality of choices would I make? I would bring a very different choice of cause and effect to the choices I make. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but that option is there. And maybe I'd treat my coworkers differently. Maybe I would hold them, maybe I would be just a little more soft-spoken to the secretaries. It'd be a little bit more reverent. I'd still do marketing, I'd still do it, but I would think and perceive differently, and I would bring grace to bear upon my choices. I think, I think the, the big difference for me is before, you, I mean, I've changed professions, but before you set a goal and basically I achieved it. Right. But now I can set a goal in a different way, which is kind of, which sounds a bit airy-fairy, but sending the energy to where I want it to go and, and what to achieve. And somehow it gets there. And then I think, well... Could I have done all I did before <laughs> without the same effort, you know, without actually being so directive towards where I was going? It just seems easier that it happens. But then you can drift into this world of, uh, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I don't know whether it is, of, well, I'll get there anyway, without 
Do you know what I mean? Just, just by sitting in the river and flowing down it. You know what? I think it's kind of like looking back on anyone's life and thinking, would I have gotten here whether or not I believed what I do? Right? That's, a, that's one of those Zen koans, right? Would I have achieved this and would I, would I be standing here and would I be healthy or would I be toxic? Would I be sick or what, what, what would I, how would my life be different if I didn't have the belief I have in, in, in God? Maybe, maybe I would still be teaching here. I seriously doubt it. I think maybe I would have been a history teacher or I'd be probably a teacher or a writer, but maybe I would be a history teacher or military. Um, what else would you do with a personality like mine, right? Or maybe I would be in the military. Um, or... Huh? America would never have gone to war. America would never have gone to war, right? Yeah. Bush wouldn't have survived. But, <laughs> but we won't go there. But I, I don't know. When you look at... You look with this sense of if I had gone conscious or unconscious. That's it. Okay, if yes, I'd gone conscious it. or un but it would have been different. I will tell you, it would have been different. Because it does matter whether you go conscious or unconscious. It does matter. It absolutely does matter. And to give you a tiny, minuscule example of that, a tiny, minuscule example, I want to back you up and place you into a memory of a relationship in which someone said, I was really hurt when you said this. And your response was, I never meant to. I didn't realize that hurt you. <coughs> you weren't conscious. And had you been conscious, you wouldn't have hurt that person. And the relationship wouldn't have hit the rocks but you weren't conscious. And it did matter that you were conscious in the relationship. It did make a difference. It makes a big difference because relationships in which you're conscious stay together. And when you're not, they don't. You don't just drift down the river, you drift apart when you're not conscious. I think I was maybe a bit con more conscious than I thought when I was unconscious. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Deal with yourself. No more questions. I have an agenda. I can't take any more questions now. No more. No more. Okay. Um, what I do want I, I know that none of you did your homework. I can count on it. But that's not good enough because you need to. You need to because here's what's true about healing and about the Western person. The Western person does not dig deep. They visit places, but they don't dig deep. And what healing requires is that you don't just listen and then get critical about what you're listening to and decide whether or not you're amused or whether or not you like it or whether or not it suits you, you actually have to do the work. You actually have to examine yourself. And so this matter of how has my pride truly affected the struggles in my life? to the point where it's made me toxic, to the point where it's actually made me sick, made a relationship toxic, where I need to, you need to feel that and own and recognize how forceful this is in you, where it's kept you up at night, where it's disrupted your life, where it's disrupted your thinking, where it's made you unclear, where it has led to the point where you will lock in to a position about yourself. You will lock into it 
and you will stay in that position even if you're wrong. And what you need to know is your immune system pays the price. Maybe your family pays the price, maybe a relationship. And all that does is build in your pride. Or that it touches into when, when you've had a sense of, of shame or when you've had a sense of embarrassment because your family has told you this is what you need to have in order to accomplish or become something. These are the standards you need to have. And if you don't have those, this is not much. You are, you'll never achieve that. And likewise, what have you told the next generation that you are responsible for? Let's go down a notch. What have you passed down and what have you forced down the throats of your children that they need to live up to or you will make them feel ashamed? You will make them feel they're not enough because you, apples don't fall far from trees. And this is all versus that grace. And if you can touch that, what you real, and, and when you think of reverence, I want you to think about someone you have this battle with and how difficult it would be to, for example, go up to them and even in your heart, even in your mind, and say, I, I'm going to hold you in a great deal of reverence. I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to shift strategies here. We have a bad power play going on, but I, I've made the decision. And it'll never make sense to you, and I really don't care. But my decision is that I'm going to see you as someone on sacred ground and hold you in reverence. And uh, that's it. I just want you to know that, and that's it. Okay. Now picture that, okay, your boss, or I, I, I'm just, I just want you to know it doesn't matter. Goodbye. And how, but if you, if you stay with that for one second, you realize the difficulty in doing that is a measure of how powerful that grace is. That it's so hard to do that shows you how powerful it is, a grace, because it must be one hell of a grace that I am holding back, that my pride finds it so hard to give that grace. It must be that powerful a grace. Do, are you with me here? Like, God, I don't want to give this grace. Mm -mm 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 -mm. But here's, at the end of the day, you face the option. I must have be one potent person that I could give that kind of grace to someone. And imagine how forceful that grace really is if we held each other in that reverence without limits. If our pride was really not in the way and we thought, you don't, you don't imagine if you just, here's something else for your assignment, put it down, put it down. What are the requirements you've created in your head that someone needs to meet before your pride will let them in? What are the requirements someone needs to meet? Requirements. In other words, before you feel safe with them. Remember I told you this first chakra is your territory, your land. So before you feel safe with them, before you feel like they're not going to humiliate you, what are the requirements? that you see that they have to fulfill? What, what are they that they have to fulfill before you think, okay, now you can come close? Because you do this. This is archetypal, this is instinctual. You see someone and you think, oh no, you don't. You can't come anywhere near me or anywhere near anything until I, and you, you, sometimes you do it this fast. You check them out, but you do. So I'm asking you to pause and check it out. You think, are they taller than me? Are they smarter? Are they, are they Martians? Where are they from? Are they this or they that? Are they whatever, whatever you look for, you note it. 
Are they better athletes? I don't know, I ever have to worry about that. <laughs> I could care less. <laughs> Thank God. Okay, so you just check. What's your checklist? What's your pride checklist? And, the, huh? and they have to be extraordinary. They have to be an ordinary. I only let ordinaries into my extraordinary parlor, right? But when you think, all right, you check down the checklist, and then you decide, okay, I'll let them in. And then I want you to do this, because then what I'm going to do is have you just get into a little group and chat. Just for a few minutes, I want you to share. And here's the reason I want you to share these things. Nothing's real till it comes out of your mouth. Nothing's real till it comes out of your mouth. If it doesn't come out of your mouth, you will play games. So it has to come out of your mouth. So write down, note this, and then you get to have a little group for a few, few, few minutes. But none of you can be in a group with your family members. Someone's lucky enough to get you. <laughs> and no cement. You have to, everybody, I would love you to kind of be with people that you have not met before. I know there are a lot of CMED, wondrous CMED students here, and I'm going to separate all of you from each other. I see all these buddies. <laughs>